Yeah, I don't. Bob said nine forty-five. Then he said something came up, and now he's got to. I don't know. Okay. So, so we can. I guess we can start, and then you can piece it together if we get Bob in here. Might as well get it done, right? <laughs> well, I got lots to talk about with Tesla. Yippee! <laughs> Tesla's I, my... I was going to make a suggestion that if we stop bashing Tesla, then we can get that prime Tesla fanboy market. I... Uh, uh, <laughs> no, it's more fun to bash Tesla. <laughs> The advice provided on this podcast is general advice only. All statements made are considered by the participants to be accurate, but accuracy cannot be guaranteed. It has been prepared without taking into account your objectives, financial situations, or needs. All participants in this podcast, including guests, may have a financial interest in any or all of the products or services mentioned. Before acting on this advice, you should consider the appropriateness of the advice having regard to your own objectives, financial situations, and needs. If any private products are detailed on this podcast, you should obtain a product disclosure statement relating to the products and consider its contents before making any decisions. Where quoted, past performance is not indicative of future results. Welcome to the Money Path Podcast, episode 114, with your hosts, Bob Iacchino and Mike Arnold, founders of Path Trading Partners. On today's episode, we've stitched together two different recording times with Bob and Mike, so let's just get right on to a casual conversation of news and the markets. Hello. 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 There we are. What's up, boys? Well, you've missed everything, Bob. What did I miss? What did Elon do? You you missed like the whole show's become Elon bashing. <laughs> That's what the show has become. <laughs> actually, no, we had to talk about that. We actually had to because they hit their uh they you know their delivery numbers and everything else, and then we had the fire at the plant and uh, everything. So yeah, I mean, look, I'm not I'm not criticizing that. So it has to become that because he's so much more interesting than he was when the show started, and he was interesting then. Now it's just it's like I I'm I sit at the edge of my seat to see what he'll tweet out next. He's insane. I think he's going for that sort of ploy, you know. What? Maybe he's going for that. You can't blame me because I you've seen I'm nuts all along. Ploy. So when it does go bankrupt, which he said there's no way it can go bankrupt, even though he <laughs> treated out the April Fool's thing that it, you know was bankrupt. It's all just a, it's it's 4D chess. It's Elon Musk 4D chess. <laughs> Elon Musk is now like, what's the name of the guy who overplayed Lex Luthor in Batman versus Superman? Just completely overplayed the character, Jesse something or other. The guy from Facebook who who has to go before yeah. Congress. Yeah, the guy he overplayed Lex Luthor in Batman versus Superman. That's what Elon's going for right now. Uh, like an overplay of himself. If Elon can troll the, the Tesla fanboys to want him out, then it's not his fault. He just gets taken <laughs> out. That's just nuts. The guy's nuts. The guy is nuts. Uh, by the way, Bob. Yeah. I got some other questions for you, things we've already covered, but we can oh, get yeah. it in here. I want your take on, well, it's Unemployment Friday. Uh-huh. And you are Mr. Fundamental. See, I'm just Mr. Technical Analysis boy, so I don't know anything about fundamentals. This was um, a better number than people are saying it was. So I'm sure you went through the metrics of it already, right? Yeah, I've, I've covered the, you know, the revisions, the the 103,000 versus 185 expected. Uh, but yeah, the, the dip in the participation rate, the... So uh, the, the increase in workers' wages. Yeah, hourly earnings as expected. It is very hard to do 200000 a month on the button when you're at what economists call full employment. Because if you think about it, now it's a matter of luring people into the labor force, luring people out of their sort of whatever they've done to take care of themselves financially or otherwise – when they've been unemployed all this time. So we saw a dip in the labor force participation rate, and that's why this is 100,000 instead of 200,000. With the revisions down 50,000 over the past two months, 
you're still at about 200,000 jobs a month. And when you have 200,000 jobs a month and 4% unemployment, 4.1, that's actually a really good economy because you're adding jobs even though there's no one left to hire theoretically. Now, all this is, of course, theoretical because there's a lot of people out there and the U6 number still shows there's a lot of people out of work. But if they don't have the skill set, you can't hire them. If they want too much money to switch jobs, you can't hire them. So to be able to add net 200,000 jobs over the last three to four months while we've had such a a low 4% handle unemployment rate is actually pretty good. Now, having said that, the, the wage growth still isn't there. It came in with wage growth, but it came in as expected. And you saw the 10-year note go from 283 yesterday to 279 or so last time I checked. So still no inflation. Now, gold is rallying, but gold didn't actually like overly extend its rally after the non-farm payrolls number. And we've talked about this before. Gold is actually not a great inflation hedge anyway. So we're still not seeing inflation. I mean, we're just we're just not seeing it. We're not seeing wage growth. We're not seeing inflation. So it's it's a good number. I mean, it's a good number to show that the U.S. economy is still strong and growing. But again, it's quite an achievement. This is the love, the basic take of it. It's quite an achievement to get two hundred thousand jobs a month when you're at four four percent unemployment. That's hard to do. Well, there's Bob's take on the number. I also don't want your take on crude because we have. Uh, at my what segment, I we have a potential massive double top on a weekly basis. Crude oil, worst week in a while, right? I mean, falling from that second or third attempt up above 65 and falling down below 63 is pretty weak. There's a couple of things happening in crude. Russia exceeded the agreed upon production quota, right? They, they went above what their part of the production quota is supposed to be, you know, the agreed upon thing with OPEC. U.S. more records in terms of production. However, I still don't think we're breaking down based on supply and demand. I don't. We saw a build in crude oil on the API side and a draw in gasoline. And then we saw, I believe it was a draw and a draw on Wednesday. Yeah, there's a draw on gasoline, a draw on crude oil on, with the EIA figures. And this, of course, uh, again, is the same sort of theme playing. The, the seasonals are pretty strong to the upside right now, although I think they're going to end quicker this year than they normally do. They usually te- like peter off around June or so. I think it's probably going to happen around May in terms of the sell-off seasonally. That usually happens in June. I think it's going to happen around May. But... You're getting a situation now where the effect of the sell-off in crude is all on the perceived destruction of demand growth because of a perceived global slowdown, because of a perceived trade war. So it's like three levels of perceived, and I don't think two of them play out. I certainly don't think the third uh, is something that's going to happen or, or is actually happening yet. You know, people talk about the trade war. I don't see it as a trade war yet. Um I wrote an article this morning, and I basically said this reminds me of the the Austin Powers movie where he says, if you don't, you know, I'll fire the laser beam at the earth if you don't give me $1 million. And then when he finds out it's not enough, he goes $100 billion, right? That's what the trade war is happening now. They just keep announcing, we're going to do more, then we're going to do more, then we're going to do more. I actually think the president is being extremely clever right now. I really do. Um, the rule has always been don't embarrass the Chinese. Yet they keep getting caught by the WTO, not by me, stealing intellectual property. WTO says they do it. Um, they put a 25% tariff on U.S. cars going into China. There was already a 25% tariff. So now there's a 50% tariff. So when people say, oh, you know, the tariffs aren't a good idea, well, China's already been doing it to the U.S. for a long, long time. And I think the president says, you know, none of this other stuff has been working. They still have tariffs and they still steal intellectual property. And at the end of the day, we buy a heck of a lot more from them than they buy from us. 
So I think this is all rhetoric, and I don't think there's going to be a global slowdown based off of this, and I don't think crude is going to continue too much lower once the market figures that out. But that's the sell-off now. The sell-off is perceived slow of demand because we're actually getting rid of the oil glut. Well, OPEC is, not us. We're down to the low 40 million barrels a day in terms of the glut, which was over 100 before. So the OPEC cuts are working in terms of eliminating the excess crude oil that's in the system. But right now we're talking about, well, there's there's a trade war, and so there's going to be no demand for crude oil. I think that's crap. I don't think that happens. But having said that, price action says lower than lower is fine with me. I don't care. Well, it's not triggered yet. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I don't know if it will trigger. It's just interesting. You got to, I like to call it out before it happens, though. In case it does trigger. And this episode of Breakfast with Bob is sponsored by... <laughs> what are you having for breakfast, Bob? I have a salad with a mix of chipotle lime dressing, ranch, and guacamole as the dressing. And that's been Breakfast with Bob. Back to you, Bob Mike. <laughs> I'm going to hit mute when I'm chewing. Is that the, is that the theme? <laughs> no, we're just going to call you out on it. This is gonna, this is Good. Gonna I like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, is Bob eating? I like that. <laughs> So any, anything else that you could touch on from the U.S. economy segment or anything from the foreign markets that you want to touch on? Because I've covered everything else. Not really, no. Nothing? No. I'm going to tell you that I've been, I mean, as you know, you guys know, I've been moving all week, so I've actually been somewhat detached. There's certain things that I have to pay attention to for responsibilities I have, but I've been really detached. Like, I don't know what's going on in the foreign markets other than, the yen is probably still a buy. So I've been basically watching the headline stuff more than anything. Well, the only thing that jumped out at me this week was that Bullard says it's not necessary to raise rates further, although he's a non-voting member. <laughs> well, I do think that uh, that they're going to have to back off. If the yield curve has been flattening again. And that's because the Fed has their three rate hikes, of which they've already done one. And the Treasury's the yield keeps going lower. So unless the Fed wants to invert the curve themselves, they're going to have to back off. So I think you're going to see more and more commentary that, you know, we might do two, not three. We might do two. I think you're going to see more and more hinting of that so that the market kind of backs off a little bit. Uh, would So if you did two more this year, why are you, it would it uh, where it stands three. That yeah, would be what they're predicting. Would it invert it? No, not necessarily, but we don't know where the 10 years can end up, right? So, no, it wouldn't. You don't have your magic crystal ball that tells us exactly what's going to happen in the future? Well, what we got to worry about is the Fed doesn't control the two-year note, although they have more effect on it. It's the twos, tens that is the most reliable predictor of recession. So, obviously, if they raise overnight lending rates, it affects the short end of the yield curve and the Treasury quadrant more than the long end. So they don't have control over any of that um, in a non-conspiratorial way. I don't know if they do in a conspiracy world, but um, they control the overnight lending rate you know, and the discount rate. And when they raise that, the two-year tends to either stabilize or go a little bit higher in yield. And I don't know where the yield curve is today. We should take a look. But it had gone from from about 50 to about 80 and then back down to about, I want to say, 60-something. But uh, it was it was flattening pretty aggressively. Let's see if I can find where it is right now while we're talking. What is a yield curve? Oh, here we go. The official U.S. Department of Treasury yield curve. Twos to ten spread is sixty three basis points. No, oh, I'm sorry, fifty three basis points. Wow. 53 basis points. Yeah, that's that's widened about three basis points since the 2nd of April. So it's widened a little bit. And then, again, it's coming with this idea that the Fed can't do three. And, and what's the basis for that widening? <laughs> <laughs> the basis of the basis? Yes. <laughs> you know, I had to get one stupid thing in. Well, you were What's on. That? What's that? 
I just had to make a stupid joke. Oh, else, that it, specific joke, yeah. I, I mean, to... else people would think that something had happened to me, and it was there was an imposter robot filling in. <laughs> Did Tesla release their numbers for the quarter yet? That's coming, isn't it? No, they have well, They have not released their earnings. I mean, earnings won't come through until uh, what's their projected date? I got to see. It's projected to, oh, well, I don't want to know. It's going to be sometime at the beginning of May. How many cars did they make in the, this quarter? How many cars? Well, <laughs> did you find out? Did they say? Yeah. Well, yes. All right. Well, see, they... They ended quarter first quarter making 2020 Model 3 sedans per week versus 2,500 forecast. But that was like pulling everybody off, remember, the Model S and X line, and then putting all hands on deck to spit out cars so they could say we beat 2,000, although they didn't beat their 2,500 projection. They said they built 9,766 Model 3 sedans in the first quarter. So wow. and they made two thousand twenty of them in the last seven days. <laughs> so, They're gonna change the world with that car. How much does it cost again? What on average fifty five thousand oh, dollars? This is this is the future. But there, here's so they did nine thousand seven hundred sixty six Model Threes produced in thirteen weeks, which averaged seven fifty one per week. But if you take out the 2020, 2020 in the last week, that gives them seven. 1,746, so that was the first 12 weeks, it was 646 vehicles per week. They delivered, they touted their, oh, we've delivered 29,980 vehicles this first quarter and a beat year over year. However, 21,800 were Model S and X sales. And here's the last, uh, so we had 21,800 for first quarter fourth quarter 2017 that was 28,300 and uh first quarter 2017 was 25,000 so their their stuff that they make more money on is is dwindling rapidly they're making up the difference with uh their model 3s which they must have stockpiled to spit out uh 2000 something of them at the end Yes. This, this is just classic, and the stock rallied hard. It actually, we put out a video earlier this week on YouTube channel, and I talked about pro- covering a bit where it was, and then watching back up to the rotation zone. It spiked back up to uh, essentially kiss the area that was triggered the double goodbye. It's now trading to uh, ninety seven back again. Not shocking, it rallied that far because everybody was touting the numbers. Uh, but, oh, by the way, <laughs> there was a fire now this week at the Tesla plant. Did you hear about that one? No. Which one? At the Fremont plant. <laughs> I bet it's just fake news. No, I think it, because now they didn't call a fire department to handle it internally, but it did come out and, and the fire at the Tesla plant temporarily suspended production. <laughs> So there goes our 2,000 vehicles a week for next week. Uh, it's pretty funny. By the way, the National Labor Relations Board found merit to workers' claims uh, that workers, you know, unsafe working conditions and all this other stuff at Tesla. And now it's going to trial with Tesla on June 11th. So that also came out this week. Uh, Elon, this was great. Oh, over to April Fool's Day. This was the the uh, the Twitter stuff by Elon tweeting out Tesla goes bankrupt. Uh, despite here's what he tweeted out: despite intense efforts to raise money, including a latch this match sale of Easter eggs, we are said to report that we are sad to report that Tesla has gone completely and totally bankrupt. So bankrupt you can't believe it. Then he said there are many chapters of bankruptcy, and as critics rightly pointed out, Tesla has them all, including Chapter 14 and a half, the worst one. Then he tweeted out, Elon was found passed out against a Tesla Model 3 surrounded by Tesla Kila bottles and tracks of dried tears still visible on his cheeks. Yes, and when when you watch the um, financial investment channels on cable, you can see very quickly the individuals in the industry who do not have a sense of humor. Well, if I was an investor, I wouldn't find that this because there's uh, I mean, their bonds are now trading at junk status. Uh, th- this is not something you joke about if you're Tesla. 
Elon well, the we... troll. He's great. He's 4chan ready, I tell you. He's what? <laughs> He's ready for 4chan. <laughs> and, and so so they're going bankrupt. Uh He's then he's tweeted that seriously. Obviously, I'm not going to do an April Fool's joke about going bankrupt if I thought it was any chance it would actually happen. Well, <laughs> your bond market's treating it as a uh, that it's likely you could go bankrupt. And oh, he by the way, he took over Model 3 production to get that 2020 coming out this week. He says he's now sleeping back on the production floor. Uh, so you again, you, he demoted the guy from Apple who was in charge of engineering and production. He sort of said, you're not in charge of production. You just go back to engineering. And then he also said, we don't need to raise any more money. Uh, Morgan Stanley still says cas- Tesla capital raised by second half of 18 still expected. And they've just cut their price target to 185 for JP Morgan. So, it's just it's a fun thing to watch every week. I just want to see how all this plays out. Ah, <sighs> there you but, go. Oh, by the way, the uh, and one more thing, we talked about that sad Tesla crash with the on autopilot. Well, the National Transportation Safety Board's unhappy with Tesla's release of investigative information in fatal crash. So Tesla put out on their their blog that the autopilot mode was on, but the person was warned to grab back on the steering wheel before the car crashed, and he didn't do it, and uh, the car crashed. But essentially, and then there, you know, there was not the safety equipment on the road to help, you know, soften the crash. So they're blaming it on that. By the, and the NTSB was not happy because that information, while their investigation is still going on, was not supposed to be released. And in other news this week, and now a couple people, have you seen those videos where they've recreated at the crash site? No. Yeah, no. they've they've run their, their Tesla and autopilot by that same area in the crash site, and it actually does the same thing. It veers towards the same area that was hit, and they have to grab the, uh, the uh, controls. And I guess this has happened after the latest software over-the-air update to autopilot. So it's just all very interesting. So... We will see how all this plays out. It's you know what's fascinating to me because it just gives you a warning. It doesn't deactivate itself or it doesn't emergency stop you if you don't uh, grab the steering wheel. Remember we've talked about the Cadillac that has those internal facing cameras, and if it says, "Hey, you know you got to take over the wheel," and you do, it sees you in inattentive or anything else, it essentially brings the car to a halt. Well, Tesla doesn't have any of this. You know, if you don't grab the wheel. Yeah, well, the General Motors product is branded correctly because you, you have cruise control, and we all know what cruise control does. It, it lets you rest your foot a bit, but you still have to be completely aware and on top of the driving because it's not, it's not an autopilot. So General Motors Super Cruise makes sense. It's going to be, it's cruising with some super features, okay? So you actually don't expect to take your hands off the wheel and for it to automatically pilot your automobile. So the Tesla branding is really broken. Well, they've marketed it as fully autonomous even. Like, it's going to have fully autonomous features. Uh, so people already assume it's it's far more advanced than it is. Can't build those cars. Not at that, not be profitable. <laughs> you got to sell those cars at $35,000 a car. That's the whole point. Yeah, because if selling a car at $55,000, you're in a whole different category of car. I mean. Yeah, you're you're into somebody who buys that third car just because, hey, look, I got one of those cars. Right? You're really not in a position where this is truly the family car decision that we're going to run the family on it's only yes. a second car it's probably model three it's the third car that you buy well that's what's in model three it's the third <laughs> car you've hit it you figured out the branding i don't want to <laughs> hit it because then it will explode <laughs> oh it's too early to go there uh by the way start, speaking of hitting things uh, remember our Snap double top target for Snapchat? Yes. The full target was down at 15, and then beyond that, we're looking for the full gap filled down to about 14. Well, those targets were hit this week. 
they were hit uh, earlier this week. Now it's trading 1446 after trading all the way down to what? 1362. So snap target was hit. Uh, let's check in. Oh, I got to check in on blue apron. Our favorite, our favorite one. Oh, that hit a new low this week. 172. <laughs> this needs a segment name. I think it needs to be like dumb stocks. Mike tracks or something like that dumb stocks might track no well spotify <laughs> was an actual tradable pattern blue apron is just pathetic uh spotify you do you, have you ever used spotify no nor do i pay for apple i do i use no music service i don't listen to music anymore you just play your own that can be arranged <laughs> so well a lot of there's a lot of spotify plant plant uh fans Spotify. So they had their IPO, but this is not like an IPO that uh, we're used to because they didn't do the traditional initial public offering process. Process. They did a direct listing, which means there's no lockup period for the company's uh, insiders uh, or current shareholders. So they essentially just went to the open market. And normally when you do a formal IPO and not just a direct listing, there's a lockup period during the like the all the big wigs that the company can't sell for six months or whatever it is. Uh, there was no lockup period on this. So they just came out listing it. Where did it open? It opened at. Let's see, 165.90, traded up to 169, and now is down to 145.86 after hitting a low of 133.51. So uh, that's just on the Spotify appeal, but I think a lot of people dump some they, shares when they're like, woo! They had um, this guy from a band, they dress in makeup on the CNBC show. You know, with the ticker at the bottom, and this guy's name is G Gene Simmons. And I guess Gene Simmons is a really smart guy, and he says really smart things all the time. And he's such an entrepreneur, he says. And all he kept talking about was how music creators are getting ripped off by companies like Spotify and iTunes. And, um, yeah, at least he's fighting for the artist. He really gave it to him. But uh, I think the investment news was really happy to have this uh, Spotify thing because it was such a different thing to talk about. In what way? They went down to the floor and talked to the guys at the computer and how this is a different kind of IPO and how different it is. And because it's so different, it's going to be really great for all of our customers and how great it's going to be different and show me how it's done. You, I, you keep saying different a lot. <laughs> Yeah, because they there's nothing different. This is the same old <laughs> stupid, stupid. We you know, give us money for a music service. So as Gene Simmons said on CNBC, we they can steal the money from the artists. They can just steal the, the money outright. We Are need, they stealing it directly from their pockets? He even said we need laws passed in Congress to protect the artists from these music streaming companies. What? During the Spotify segment. <laughs> <laughs> He is so rock and roll. He is great. We need Congress to interfere. Can't the artists just say no? Well, there no, are laws. Not... There are laws. It all came from the 50s. I mean, you so songs are worth a certain amount of money on terrestrial radio and broadcast television and stuff. But um, streaming, you know, the, the laws definitely do not take advantage of the they – take, they take advantage of the musician. Musicians don't make any money with Spotify. It's a whole racket. It's wrong. Can can people opt out and choose to not pay Spotify and listen to music? No. What do you mean? You know. But I know there's certain bands that aren't on streaming. So how? I mean, if you're not on streaming, you're not screwed. Well, yeah. You know, if you control your publishing, you can control where your stuff goes. But what artist controls their publishing? I don't know. You can't you know? stream Tool. Yeah, they probably control their publishing. Right? From day one, they didn't, but they might now. Or they're to do a second deal, they bought their publishing up from the record company. Any, because that, of that, yeah, and that's possible. So uh, I got a I got a question for you now. I want your take on uh, Apple saying they're they're uh, not going to use Intel chips. Anymore, starting in when that was like 
as soon as 2020, they're going to use their own Mac chips. I, well, they won't be called Mac chips. Can't do that. There's some trademark, but that's Mac chips. That's what, <laughs> whatever they're called. So right Apple now, chip. the A11, the A11 chip in the iPhone 10 is a six core, a six core. So Apple is doing these workstation class cores now okay. in their architecture. So uh, one thing that Apple does really well is they do transitions really well. Um, you know, going from 68K to PowerPC, from PowerPC to Intel, it survived all those. Fantastic. Fantastically. You know, sure, maybe in the middle there's some hiccups, but they've gotten really good at, at, good at these uh, transitions. So I believe the transition will go without a hitch. That's something that Apple does really well. And I think that the chips will be fantastic um, because they know how to design fantastic chips. They have since the iPhone 4. The iPhone 4 was the first A-series processor, right? They still, the uh, 3GS had a Samsung in there. And then Apple said, okay, we're going to take control of the architecture of this die. And every year they do a new die and they're, they're fast. I, I, the 64-bit iPhones hit at the 5S. And the 64-bit operating system and hardware has been running for a while now on the phones. They really are ready for it. It will be great. It will be great. Because Intel's a problem. Intel's a problem. It slows everything down. makes makes it real difficult. Why? Why is that? Because not only do you, if you want to release a, a new product and your Apple, you want to release it with great fanfare. Like Apple is moving to the next, uh, you know, doing the next generation. It's not revving a previous one. It's here's the new product. And then when they release that, they want to have it in warehouses shipping immediately, right? So they have to have their entire production ramp up a year before they even release this product. And getting the first, you know, brand new, these are the new hot IBM chi uh, Intel chips is really impossible. Because they're not going to play any kind of favorites. They're not going to give you thousands of samples a year before they were, they're released. And the, Intel holds all that close to the chest. So Apple has to play all these games to kind of be in the sweet spot when the chips are ready for them to do mass production. And, it can, and they can release the product. And if, in, if Intel wavers with that release, and usually if it's a brand new die size, they might have wavering of until they have... Uh, large enough samples coming off the line. So with Apple taking Intel completely out of it, they are now in complete control. So they can ramp up a semiconductor that can be 24 cores on an 85-watt die, okay? Great power, incredible electric, uh, electrical use. They could ramp that up, and they can have a 1,000 ready to go. They can have these things in the warehouse when they're ready to release it publicly. And their chips will be better because they don't have to deal with all of the non-propriety, uh, you know, PC world. You know, Apple can build their own interconnect buses and it can be fantastic. So this is great. And this is one thing Apple does well. And this is what Tim Cook did before Apple. And when he came to Apple, that's all he did. He did operations. This sort of pull-off requires some serious operations. <laughs> so how do you think this is going to eventually affect like operating system rollouts and everything else because it are because of the legacy Intel hardware verse when they do their new nothing the same thing we did the same thing going when we were running Mac OS 10 on a G3 and then we were ma running Mac OS 10 on a G4 and then Mac OS 10 on the G5 and then Mac OS 10 on Intel it will be a bunch of nothing. He, Apple probably has rights to registrars. I wouldn't be surprised if they, you know, have little boxes inside of it to, to run things. So you can go five years not even knowing that you're running Intel code and it won't matter. Gotcha. Yeah. Just wanted your take on all that. Yeah, it's fine. Don't worry about it. All right. If Stafford says we don't need to worry, we don't need to worry about it. Yeah, don't worry about it. All right. Uh, <laughs> cryptocurrencies. We had Telegram, uh, the largest ever ICO, raised $2 billion. 
That was very interesting. It's the largest ICO on record. Uh, it managed to raise a staggering sum through a public token sale despite not having any plans to monetize its service. In fact, the company's CEO, who I can't say pronounce any names, so I'll just leave it at the company's CEO, has explicitly said he plans to use this money to develop Telegram Open Network blockchain payment system based off Telegram's Gram token that he hopes will one day rival Visa and MasterCard. They should add the, they should add the words Ice T at the end of their name. They'd be, do great. <laughs> Telegram Ice T. <laughs> Remember, Ice T put blockchain at the end, and that's so all they should just go and do the opposite. Like the blockchain companies start putting everybody puts Ice T at the end of their name. At some point, <laughs> that <laughs> will work. Comes full circle. <laughs> it has to. If wouldn't that so if in the secret crypto verse, if you see anything with Ice T after its name, you know it's like, hey, this could be a legit. This could be legit. That's one of the top shelf memes. Oh, by the way, this just came out this morning. Crypto platforms may violate securities law, the Canadian regulator said. So, well, I was going to see what, what stance Canada now is piping in, or if this is just something then they'll come out and say, no, it's fine. You know, we get these warning shots occasionally, and uh, nothing happens with them. By the way, we had, according to Bloomberg's Adam Fisher, uh, or – Sorry, I mean, according to Bloomberg, Adam Fisher, who uh, oversees the macro investing in the Soros fund management, that's George Soros, uh, has now officially, according to Bloomberg, received internal approval to trade virtual coins, though, quote, has yet to make a wager. Uh, I probably doubt that because <laughs> if it's coming out publicly, they've probably already established a position in that, and now they're using the public forum to try to uh, possibly change the price. We've known that these things have sold off. Where's where's Bitcoin trading right now? Sixty five eighty eight. So it's back down below seven thousand, below some of the expensive countries' mining costs. Per coin, so very interesting. The crypto market returned this week to the daily rotation zone, then resumed its its lower price. So it rallied up above seven thousand to uh, what was the high seventy, roughly seventy five hundred. Now we're trading back down at sixty five eighty eight, sixty six hundred. So we'll see the Soros, you know, the, not that he ever manipulates the markets or anything else through. Uh, right. No, he would never. Whoever that guy is, I don't know. You know I mean, have you heard of him before? I see a big player. <laughs> I saw I saw a character in Star Wars named the Emperor. Is he that guy? <laughs> Speak it. I, I just finished watching The Last Jedi last night. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so, uh, what, I what see, toys are you going to buy? What, what toys to are you going to buy? Uh, you're no doubt going to get a Luke Skywalker toy because he was such a great hero. I'm going to get him meditating on the rock toy at the I very see. end. I see. I know you haven't watched it, so. No, no, I refuse to watch it. No, but it was, it was, uh, uh it, actually took, it took me four days to watch it. I Meaning. know because they're so bad. I can imagine that's how it was for me and the other ones that that weren't. I had to ones. stop, like, and I'm like, okay, yeah, all right, I'm done for tonight. So yeah. it took me four four nights <laughs> to get through it. It was, it was, uh, it was, yeah. That's all I have to say. They they shouldn't be pumping them out so fast because the quality is just not there no, in my book. If they pump it out faster, it will. Social engineer the fan base and ch and turn it quicker because the goal is it's Star Wars theme park, Star Wars zone, right? Star Wars playland, and you. It's really not the intellectual hero of a thousand faces, a hero's journey argument, storytelling argument. It's really just you know dumb. <laughs> So you can run and go, there's a Millennium Falcon while holding a waffle cone, and you can sit down on the bench and go, these terrible kids of mine, you know, that they well, just want that theme park and the rap dancing empire, you know, all the troopers and everything dancing a rap. 
We're, I've not heard about any of this. I don't, I'm on full boycott. That's it's not going to happen. There's no reason to see it. There's no reason to see it. No reason to see. Uh, you're not going to rush out to see new Han Solo movie. Oh well. No, no. Especially since I read the book, uh, the Millennium Falcon book, which is the best novel in extended. Anyway, yeah, it, it, they're just going to wreck everything. And that that's a good that's a good uh, tie in for other space news. Sure. Elon's other company, SpaceX, they just got FCC approval to launch their one gigabit per second satellite Internet in a five zero volt. The FCC approved SpaceX plan to offer the one gigabit per second Internet via satellite Uh Unlike current satellite internet, these devices will be in far lower orbit and offer far faster speeds without the data caps current satellite systems use. SpaceX says the system will launch in two phases between 2019 and 2024. Quote, although we still have much to do with this complex undertaking, this is an important step towards SpaceX building next generation satellite network that can link the globe with reliable and affordable broadband service, especially reaching those who are not yet connected said SpaceX president Gwyn Shotwell. Isn't that a great name for a company that launches stuff into space, Shotwell? <laughs> I tell you, it's further proof that uh, these are just controlled opposition to, 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 to silence us flat earthers. Uh, you're still going with the flat earth thing? I'm moving toward a rhombus at this point. I think that's a much better shape for the earth. Why would it be a rhombus? Uh, cause there's an R and then there's an H and that's, those are, that's a crazy way to start a word. <laughs> so now your <laughs> planetary shapes based off of, uh, I got theories, dude. I got theories. <laughs> oh boy. It's all fake. It's all fake. It's all fake. It's not. Well, a what about, what about the uh, unemployment numbers that came out this morning then? Uh, Is that fake? Those are always real. Those are always real. They're always real. Well, just because this is Unemployment Friday, uh, U.S. job growth slowed in March. Unemployment rate held at 4.1 percent. U.S. non-farm payrolls rose and seasonally adjusted 103,000 in March. Uh, Slowdown from the prior month's gain. They were expecting... uh, bunch more than that. I forget, like 150-something thousand, I believe. Let me go back and see what they were expecting. Where is it? Where are my damn numbers? Uh, oh, here. Expected uh, March payrolls were 103,000, expected 185. So that was down sharply. They revised the figures for January and February. January, uh, let's see. One was revised up. So employers added 326 jobs in February and 176 in January, but that netted out to a downward revision of 50,000 jobs. Uh, if you average it for the first three months so of the year, employees, employers have averaged added an average of 202,000 202, workers to payrolls, outpacing 2017's average monthly growth of 182. Uh, Go employers! Woo! That was that was very good. <laughs> uh, now, average hourly earnings for all private sector workers increased eight cents last month to twenty six eighty two. Wages rose two point seven from a year earlier in March. So that's our unemployment report, and then we have in the the tariff. Th- Trump now threatening to put another hundred. It's a trade war. Million dollars. It's a trade war. Of trade tariffs on China. Good. So, so we'll see how that plays out, or if it's all just a bunch of bluster. Finally, this uh, geopolitical map is starting to look like a good old 1980s Milton Bradley board game. Which board game were you referring to? <laughs> Fortress America? <Yeah>. or <laughs> right. uh, board game. Ogre. Remember that? Oh, no, it's not Ogre. <laughs> Now we're in the Steve Jackson games. <laughs> so, uh, no, but I I used to play these, you know, these uh, Fortress American type games in the 80s. 
So that's your problem. Used to. You're a poser. Oh. You're a game po- board game poser. You you're you don't even play Starfleet Battles anymore. You don't even play Car Wars anymore. <laughs> well, there's better games now. <laughs> you know what's on Kickstarter? No. no a redone version of Fireball Island is coming out. Oh, I didn't. Is that a Milton Bradley one? Yes, but no, this is not being done by Milton Bradley. It's done being done by a company called Restoration Games. It actually takes like these older games and makes them up to date and improves them and everything else. They've done a, a couple of them, but I'm so excited that they're going to be doing Fireball Island. A 1986 game release is being redone. They've already raised over a million dollars. That's the way to do it. Yep. It was looking good, too. So if anybody's a big game fan, Fireball Island, if that brings you back to your childhood, if you had a copy of Fireball Island, then go check it out on Kickstarter. Uh, What else do we have? So that was our – oh, by the way, the Federal Reserve's board, who's not a voting member, says – and it makes a difference because there's voting members and non-voting members, and Bullard right now is a non-voting member, so what he says gets to be taken with a grain of salt because he can't really control policy. But he says it's not necessary to raise rates any further. He says no more rate hikes. So let's well, see. No more rate hike for anyone. No more rate hikes for anyone. By the way, the market, uh, we put out a video earlier this week, uh, came down to our 2558 mark in the futures and rallied straight back to rotation zone, now rotating back down, trading 2630. Our next major target, if we break to new lows, is uh, 2526 to 2530. That's what we're watching for. In the S and P, if it does get back below the 200 simple moving average, which right now is essentially 2593, so 2600 area. Oh, I we need a Y from you though. I'm going to go into the trade war. How about that? Go into it because I've done my what? So done you just what? have so, to do a Y. So here's my Y. Why are we going crazy over a theoretical trade war? Um, the only tariffs that have been implemented so far are 3 billion in US goods imported into China. At the end of the day, again, I think what President Trump is doing is what he's done in a lot of other areas, basically saying, look, nothing the other guys have tried have worked. Um, Let me try some kind of shock and awe stuff. You know, he came out with this idea of 60 billion in tariffs. First, he did the steel and aluminum tariffs. Um, Those still aren't implemented. There was a 60 day wait period for other countries to present their case to be exempt from these tariffs. Uh, Pretty much every ally has presented one and looks like they're on the path of acceptance of being exempt. China claims they wanted to present a case, but the U.S. hasn't responded to them. I don't know if that's true or not. So clearly the steel and aluminum tariffs, which we probably already knew were aimed at China. Then he decides that we're going to do $60 billion in tariffs directly at China's Chinese goods. Then it goes down to $50 billion. Then Mnuchin says, well, we're talking. We're not really implementing yet. Then China announces a $50 billion in-kind tariffs on U.S. goods, including things like soybeans and automobiles, which, as I just mentioned, not on soybeans, but on automobiles, there was already a tariff. And the interesting th- part about that is soybean futures fell, but the vast majority of the soybeans imported into China come from the U.S. So when they put a tariff on that, it's the Chinese people that are paying it. Um, those soybeans are most likely still going to go into China. But anyway, you know, I don't know if the demand gets reduced because soybeans are more expensive overall in China now. But soybeans are something that, you know, the the amount of soybeans you grow and import is decided a long time ago. I mean, those are grown and purchased. And that's that. For the farmers to be heard, it's going to take a little while. Anyway, I'm digressing quite a bit. I really think very little of these tariffs ever get implemented. And if they do, I think they get reversed very quickly. I, I think this is negotiation 101. And you can go out to infinity in terms of the dollar amount of tariffs you're going to place on each other. But at some point, China runs out of tariffs. Because, again, 
they import a heck of a lot less from the U.S. into their country than we import from China into here. We're a much bigger net purchaser of Chinese goods. So at some point, they will run out of things they can tariff and the amount they can tariff them because a lot of these things are needed in their economy. So I actually think this is going to end up with the president getting a fairly large set of concessions from China at the end of the day. But for the purpose of trading, you should why we're not going to get that sub 1% equity volatility anytime soon that we got the previous bunch of years. This is not going to happen. Vol is going to be crazy in there. I think it all happens before earnings are noticeably affected. So I think this next quarter earnings, which I think earnings starts next week, Mike, I think, uh, is going to be fine. And I think the economic data can trump a lot of this downside volatility, no pun intended. So that's my why. Don't worry about the tariffs yet. Gotcha. I have more uh, Tesla bashing breaking news. What's that? See what happens when you give me a couple minutes and you're doing your why? <laughs> uh They've just been sued. This this got just posted on the court docket in uh, Alameda County. One of their suppliers is suing them for not paying their bills. Oh, there you go. First one. So first of many, I'm sure. Yes, that's what the whole chain is now. Everybody's like, uh, the, this is like the first one that's going to open the dam because they're like going back for years. They're saying they haven't paid since. Uh, oh, it's been it's been a while. Like three years. <laughs> it's not. So, oh, and this is another breaking news related to Tesla, but not exactly Tesla. First review on Autoblog of the 2019 Jaguar I-Pace. That's uh, electric. Just, yes, this is the new electric. It's coming out. Uh, here's a couple things. What I can definitely declare, however, is that the 2019 I-Pace boasts far superior inter- interior quality than every Tesla I've driven. Also, he says at the end, because he says he wants more driving time because he only got a few minutes of it. Uh, He says, and really, if this thing had a spiky T logo on its trunk rather than a leaping cat, I'd wager the internet internet would melt, women would faint in the streets, and waiting lists would stretch to Mars. (laughs) (laughs) The first impressions of the I-Pace are looking very good in the electric car market. So we shall see if that actually makes a dent in uh, Tesla's uh, sales because, as we said before, Model S and X sales are dropping rapidly. And I think more and more people are going to wait for some of these other things that are going to hit the market soon. That's awesome. So that is my uh, my update, the breaking news on Tesla update, which is just tongue-in-cheek right now. Of course. <laughs> He is so fun. It's just fun. It's just fun. Every day it's just to see what 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 Elon's gonna do next. Alright guys, well sorry I came in late and uh, next week I should be back full time, so appreciate you making the time for me. Is that a threat? Uh, yes. <laughs> Take it very seriously because I am not messing around here. Should I should I come up with my own retaliatory uh, comments? Yeah, we can save it for next week. <laughs> I'm going to put a tariff on you. I feel tariffed. Well, you had just a salad for breakfast, so you should feel tariffed. <laughs> your, your jokes are terrible. Terrible, terrible. That's the show, guys. Terrible. That's the show, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming out. Make sure you get a spicy burrito at the counter. Thanks, you all. <laughs> Cheers, guys. I got to run. And who are you? I'm Bob Aitino. Oh, and I'm Mike Arnold, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye for now. See you, guys.